Tengriism was the original religion of the Turks, Mongols, and other steppe peoples of Eurasia. This religion was also a philosophy of life, which taught people to live in harmony with nature. Waste, gluttony, and environmental destruction were frowned upon. And women played a major role in the cohesion of Tengrist societies. We learned that much last time. However, there are some central elements of Tengriism that recognizably articulate those precepts or teachings in the form of motifs. These elements are worthy of closer examination, because doing so will give us a deeper insight into the foundations of Tengriism. Tengri himself is still at the center of Tengriism, one might think. After all, the ruler of heaven is also the eponym for the religion itself. Tengri is indeed an omnipotent ruler, all-knowing and all-powerful. But to maintain the balance on earth, more actors are needed to implement Tengri's will of harmony. Among them is Umai, who can be equated with Mother Earth. Tengri and Umai were like man and woman, two beings who complemented each other. While Tengri ruled the sky above and watched over the people, Umai was responsible for the balance on earth. Accordingly, she took the role of a protector of all souls who had not yet come into the world of humankind and whose birth was imminent. Therefore, to this day, there are rituals before and after the birth of a child, in which the family sends petitions and thanks to Umai, in the hope that the infant will be born healthy with Umai's blessing. Umai's role is therefore more specific than Tengri's. But both entities have been used to legitimize Turkic ruling dynasties over the centuries. For example, the leaders of the second Gok Turk Khaganate, who were from the Ashina and Ashide families, claimed the following in the famous Orkhan inscriptions All Turk people degraded and their country went to ruins. Then the Turk Tengri above, Umay on earth, and the Yersu said, In order for the Turks to not go to ruin, they should become a nation again. Then they, Tengri and Umay, rose my father and my mother to the top and sat them upwards on the throne. My father gathered seventeen brave lords, then seventy brave men against his enemies. Tengri gave them power, and they grew. My father's army was like wolves, their enemies were like sheep. The speaker of this text is Kul Tegan, a famous prince and brother of Bilgeh Kagan. He indirectly legitimized the rule of his father, the Kagan, and his mother, the Kegatun, through the intervention and will of Tengri, Umai, and the Yersu. Thus, by the second Gokturk Empire at the latest, Tengriism was not only the state religion, but the basis of the legitimacy for the rule of the Ashina dynasty, and for that matter, of any Turkic state. But Tengri and Umai have another ally, who could be also referred to as an adversary, because further beneath, in the literal underworld, resides Erlik. The Turks refer to the underworld as Tameg. However, since Tameg is not to be perceived as hell as in Abrahamic religions, in which evil people burn forever in purgatory, Erlik is also not necessarily to be understood as a punisher with malicious intentions. Rather, he is active as a guardian who ensures that the lost souls atone for their sins, and can then ascend to the afterlife after some time. It is not Ehrlich who decides whether someone has sinned or not. He can only decide the amount of punishment. But whether someone has to go to the underworld at all, instead of going to the hereafter right away, is not solely at his discretion. Instead, the interactions between Ehrlich, Umai, and Tengri is responsible for this process. In the other world, which is called Ujmeg, all the souls who have lived a good life are already dwelling, as well as some godlike entities mentioned last time. Just as Ehrlich resides on the lowest level of Tameg, Tengri resides on the highest level of Ujmeg. Ujmeg literally means to fly away in Turkish, as the Turks assumed that the soul of a deceased person would leave the body and literally ascend to heaven. In Tengriism, the afterlife is a place similar to Earth, but with untouched nature and full of souls who neither commit sins nor violate the rules of harmony. In a certain sense, the cosmology of the Turks and Mongols is very similar to the worldviews of other cultures. 
Parabells can be seen with the ancient religions of the Chinese, Koreans, Vikings, and Indians. But to maintain the balance of power, Tengri, Umai, and Erlik need other beings to serve as their assistants. Tengri and Umai regularly send messengers out into the world of humans to observe developments within society. Such messengers can appear in the form of animals as well as things in nature. They are called Yersu, earth water spirits. According to a certain concept of the Altaic Turks, certain souls, after arriving in the afterlife, are sent back by Tengri and take up space in trees, stones, or even whole mountains. This idea that human souls can be found everywhere in nature watching over people perhaps creates a sense of melancholy. There could also be a sort of hidden animal kingdom within society. Ravens, which have a positive connotations among Asian peoples, gather information and pass it on to hawks, which then fly from town to town, country to long, informing other messengers. Other animals such as lions and cheetahs also occupy important positions in human society, depending on the cultural group. We must keep in mind that in ancient times and the Middle Ages, people and animals lived relatively close to each other. For example, it was not unusual for noble families to acquire cheetahs as pets. The importance of the wolf among the ancient Turks have already been described in detail. For example, in the first film of the Gok Turk trilogy, you can watch it by clicking on the eye in the right corner of the video. The wolf and its descendants in the form of dogs are consistently perceived throughout Turkic history, at least in Asia, as animals with important roles. It was Asina, a she-wolf with shimmering blue fur sent by Tengri, who once saved a wounded boy from death and raised him. Asina thus laid the foundation for a new family, a new lineage of nobles in form of the Ashina dynasty, who later founded the Gok Turk Empire. But Asina and the other animals had a point of reference during their stay on Earth, which served as the Axis Mundi of Turkic cosmology. The Tree of Life This tree, figuratively speaking of course, is to be understood as a connecting link through which information and even beings are transported from the earth to the afterlife or the underworld. The roots of the tree of life reached so deep into the earth, and its branches extended so high into the sky, that all information generated in the world was absorbed and passed on by the tree of life. The ensouled animals, which served as observers or protectors of the people, returned again and again to the tree of life to pass on their information or to exchange information directly. One must not take the entire concept too literally. But in a sense, the tree of life was also an elevator for the deities, the deceased, and a few chosen people on earth to ascend and descend between the floors of the world. However, because the tree of life is connected to all living things, even if people do not feel this for themselves, it would feel any destruction of nature. If we take the known facts about the Tree of Life in Tengriism at hand, and consider nevertheless that an invisible life stream flows through the Earth, we might assume in the next step that the Tree of Life is connected with the life stream. Perhaps in the old Turkish cosmology, the Tree of Life should serve in order to articulate the abstract idea of a stream of life for the common people in an understandable way. According to the teachings of Tengriism, if people violate the rules of Tengriism and harm nature, they would, on the other hand, become evil souls who must go to repent in the underworld. But on the other hand, the stream of life, which also includes all people, would thus receive a deficiency. Let us assume that scores of people mutate into evil souls. For example, because they are seduced by someone to do bad things. A man or woman who ascends to the ruler of the people and seduces his subject to exploit the earth massively for his benefit, for his power preservation. There would certainly be an imbalance in society. But what we must go a step further and theorize the effects for all life. Because the more evil souls there would be, the greater the defect of the life stream would become. Now if this stream flows through the tree of life, and the tree witnesses everything that happens on earth anyway, 
We obviously assume that the tree is sentient in some way, shape, or form. Wouldn't it also suffer damage? Wouldn't the leaves of the tree of life dry up? The branches fall down from the sky, and the roots shrivel up under the earth. Wouldn't the tree of life then decay and die? As a logical consequence, the connection between Ujmag, Tamag, between afterlife, underworld, and earth would be disturbed. The tree of life could serve neither as a refuge for the animals that would need to retreat here from the exploits of humans, nor as a portal for information exchange. It could also no longer serve as a tool for the deities of the pantheon to exchange between the worlds. This is nothing but a theory on the part of the author of this video, but nonetheless it would certainly be interesting to delve deeper into such abstract thoughts and supplement the parts of Tengriism that are missing. The Tree of Life is the central element of Turkish cosmology, and furthermore of the Tengriist belief of other cultural groups. This is why motifs depicting the Tree of Life in its full glory can still be found on textiles and even banknotes within the Turkic world. This is also true of the Turkic deities. But while Tengri, Umay, and Yersu, and of course Erlik, seem to form a symbiosis to ensure the balance of power in the world, the story of Tengriism does not end there. Because the overlap between Tengriism and Turkic mythology is significant, the pantheon of Turkic or Turkish deities is also vast. Even if none of these beings possess a power as great as Tengri, it is still worthwhile to look at the mythology, the numerous legends and myths, as well as the folklore that the Turks pass on from generation to generation. So, in some ways, there are overlaps between Tengriism with the mythological beliefs of other cultures. And it's amazing how many people in the first video about Tengriism talked about the similarities with other belief systems. Do you see any overlaps in the topics we explained this time as well? The afterlife and the underworld, the Yersu spirits, and the tree of life. Does any of it sound familiar? Write down your thoughts in the comment section below. And if you want to learn more about Tengriism or ancient Turkic history, subscribe to this channel. There is much more to come in the near future. Emre is simultaneously working on a book about the Gok Turk Empire, in which he also goes into detail about the foundations of Tengriism. The book will become available on April 11th in English as well as in German. Pre-orders will be up soon. Also in April, he will have completed the second movie of his Gok Turk trilogy, which covers the time period of 630 to 681 CE of the Turkic world. This video was made by Emre Yavuz and narrated by me, Byron Caldwell.